Well, good evening and welcome to this uh, Sunday evening service from Money Hall Church. My name's Andy Cole. I'm, I'm one of the ministers of the church and I'm going to be leading the service briefly for us. Uh, a little bit later, um, one of our other elders, Don Morrison, will be preaching God's word for us. I want to begin with uh, just reading a few verses from the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53. These are, these are incredible words written over 600 years before the Lord Jesus. Uh, and yet they speak so powerfully uh, about who he is and, and what he came to do. Uh, let's hear these words from Isaiah. He was despised and rejected by mankind. A, a man of suffering, a man of sorrows, familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. That's a great prophecy, uh, pointing forward to what Jesus would do by dying on the cross for us. He would bear our pain, bear the punishment that our sins deserved, so that we could know peace with God. That's good news this evening as we gather together for worship. We can come to to the Lord God, the almighty, holy God, uh, confident uh, that he will accept us, not because of ourselves, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for us by dying on the cross. Well, we're going to begin our time of worship with a couple of opening songs. Uh, Praise to the Lord and Cornerstone. Uh, and after we've had these two songs, uh, one of our other elders, Mark Wiggins is going to lead us in prayer before Don opens up God's word for us. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise.
righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name my hope is built on nothing less together. Father, we come to you as rebels, as those who've done wrong in your sight. Lord God, we confess that though you've created us and have given us every good thing, from the smallest breath to our most precious possession, we have not given you the thanks you deserve. We've so often lived for ourselves, for our own glory and desires. Forgive us our ingratitude, Father. Forgive us our idolatry, forgive us our rebellion and pride. We ask for your mercy and your grace in our helplessness. God, would you lift our eyes to see more of who you are? You alone are God. You are the sovereign Lord, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and we praise you. That whilst being glorious in your holiness, your power and your majesty, you are a personal God who has made himself known to us, to sinners. You're our Father. You're a faithful God who keeps his word, a loving God, full of mercy and grace, and we praise you. Right now, God, many of us feel weary, we feel tired. But God, we praise you that you are in control, that your plans are being perfectly fulfilled each and every day. 
that you never sleep or slumber. You're constantly watching over our coming and our going. God, please help us to fix our eyes on you, the one who will not let us fall or stumble, to trust you and the certain hope we have in Christ's death and resurrection. God, we pray for Moneyhold Church and we pray that we would increasingly be a community encouraging one another with the good news of who you are and what you've done in our lives. A community looking out for one another and seeking to love as you first loved us. But would we not be an inward looking community? Would we be motivated by that love? God, we think of the estate where you've placed our church building. We think of the neighbours we live by, the colleagues we work alongside, the parents we interact with at the school gate. And we pray we'll be salt and light in those communities. In these days of lockdown, um, God, I praise you that we have a certain hope in a world that is desperately seeking such hope. God, would we be looking for opportunities to build relationships and share that good news in those communities where you've placed us? And God, we give thanks for the events week that took place this last week at Birmingham University for um, Tim Rudge clearly and faithfully proclaiming the good news of Jesus. We pray for all those students um, that they might have been encouraged in their faith and that their time in uni might be one of being equipped for a lifetime of living and speaking for Jesus. We thank you that many watch those online events and we pray that they might take up the invitation to read John's Gospel for themselves, to meet up with a Christian. God, we'd love to see as our church doors open again at the end of lockdown, we'd love to see students coming into local churches for the first time because of the evangelistic witness of Christian students. And specifically, God, we want to praise you for the encouraging number of international students from all over the world who've engaged with these online events. And we pray not only for changed lives, that you might transform those communities to which they belong, that the gospel might continue to grow in all corners of the world. And finally, God, we thank you for your word. And we pray that as we listen to Don open the Bible for us this evening, that you would give us open hearts. Would we not simply hear, but would your word, word take root in our heart by the power of your spirit and would it be bearing fruit in our lives, we pray. God, for your glory. Amen. Our Bible reading is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, and we're going to read verses 47 to 62. Luke 22, verse 47. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts and you did not lay a hand on me. But this is your hour when darkness reigns. Then seizing him, they led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and had sat down together, Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, This man was with him. But he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. Man, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, Certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, Man, I don't know what you are talking about. Just as he was speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. 
Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the cock crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Well, this is a very familiar passage from Luke's Gospel. It gives us the story, the narrative of the arrest of Jesus. We read about the betrayal of Jesus by one of his closest friends, his disciple Judas. We read about the abject failure of the beloved disciple Peter to live up to the rash commitments that he had earlier made. He said even though all the other disciples may desert Jesus, he never would. And we read of how Jesus himself responded as he approached this hour of trial, this hour of greatest trial. Now there are many ways that we could interpret this story, many ways we could look at it uh, to see what we might learn from it. Uh, but I'd like to spend just a few moments reflecting on it in terms of the protagonists in the story, the major characters, specifically Judas, Peter and Jesus himself. What does this passage tell us about their motivations? What lessons can we learn? What pitfalls can we avoid? How do we apply what we learn in our own lives as we seek to live in a way that pleases our Lord and Saviour? So my first heading is Judas, the calculating betrayer. Judas, the calculating betrayer. If we read all the verses in the Bible about Judas, we are forced to just one conclusion. To put it in the modern vernacular, Judas was a rather nasty piece of work. We struggle to find in Judas any redeeming qualities. I suppose the best we can say of Judas is that he was good with money. The only problem is he was a thief. He was trusted with the money that Jesus and the disciples had. Somebody had to be the keeper of the money bag. So at some point, the disciples must have decided that he was the man for the job. But what do we read in John 12, that narrative when Mary uh, took the pure nard and poured it on Jesus' feet? This is what John writes. Then Mary took about a half a litre of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Here is a man who was motivated by money. A man who valued money above all else. He valued money above reputation. He valued money above integrity. He valued money above friendship. He valued money above the Lord Jesus himself. I wonder if the Apostle Paul had Judas in mind when he wrote these words to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You see, Judas didn't betray Jesus because of some high-flown, albeit misguided, principle. Now, what did Judas say when he went to the high priests? What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So here is a man who is consistently evil, a man of few redeeming qualities. For three years, he walked with Jesus as his friend. Now, some people of a previously good character have a sudden fall, and it's a sudden and dramatic loss of reputation. But not Judas. Judas is someone who is engaged in a long-term, calculated lifestyle of deception. 
culminating in the ultimate blasphemy. He betrayed the Lord Jesus with a kiss. And the other disciples had no idea. No one suspected him except Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus told the disciples that one of them would betray him? There was absolute consternation. Surely you don't mean me, Lord. They were so concerned that it might be them. Apparently, there were no knowing looks among the disciples. They didn't look at each other and say, oh, we know who that is. Surely that must be Judas. It's got to be him. And if we know the story of Judas, we know that he came to a desperate end. Almost Shakespearean in its tragedy. No true repentance for his sins, just simply remorse for the consequences of his betrayal. Now, I said we were going to try to learn some lessons and make some applications from this. And we might feel that it's difficult to find applications from this story of Judas. After all, Judas was so irredeemably evil, so consistently evil, so unlike us in so many ways. Surely there is so little that we can learn from his life. In passing, I would mention that uh, the love of money that Judas displayed is still with us. But I have two other applications that I mentioned briefly. The first is this. Have you ever reflected on the fact that Jesus spent three years in the company of Jesus? Three years in the company of his disciples. But it had no effect. Jesus, uh, Judas witnessed Jesus' miracles. Judas heard the sermons. Judas heard the parables. He spent three years in the company of the disciples. There's a messianic psalm which tells us that Judas was one of Jesus' closest friends. He had the privilege of seeing Jesus at close quarters. And yet, he was unchanged by it all. That's a very salutary thing for us, isn't it? Because sometimes we think, oh, if only I saw Jesus face to face, then things would be different. It would have a profound effect on my life. Here's a man who walked and talked with him, was a close friend of his for three years, walked closely with the friends of Jesus and was utterly unchanged. What about you? Perhaps you're growing up in a Christian home. Perhaps you've been coming to church for years. So you are a friend of those who are friends of Jesus. You hear Jesus teaching. You hear about his miracles, his parables, and yet you are utterly unchanged by it. What a tragedy for Judas. What a tragedy for us. If we walk with those who love Jesus and hear from the lips of Jesus and are utterly unchanged by it. But my second application is this. Are we what we appear to be? Judas wasn't. Would people be surprised, possibly even shocked, to see how we behave, conduct ourselves, when we're not in church? Judas was leading a double life. He appeared to be one thing. He appeared to be a faithful disciple of Jesus. He appeared to love Jesus. He appeared to want to walk with Jesus. He, he wanted to listen to Jesus. But he was lead, leading a double life. The disciples were fooled, but Jesus was never fooled. We read elsewhere that Jesus understood and knew what was in people, and he knew Judas. Now, as we leave Judas, we're going to move on to the next disciple, Simon Peter. Now, Simon Peter himself was unquestionably a flawed character. But it's a very different story for Peter than it is for Judas. You see, Peter repented of denying his Lord. If Judas is the calculating betrayer, we're going to give Peter two headings. Here's the first. Peter is the misguided defender. The misguided defender. Peter was outspoken. 
We might say Peter was one of these larger-than-life characters, a big personality, always first to speak, but sadly, consistently putting his foot in it. But we might say of Peter, for all his mistakes, his heart was in the right place. He really did love Jesus, but he was always getting things wrong. There are several examples in the Gospel, but one of the most spectacular happened just after one of Peter's greatest insights. Jesus and his disciples are in this place called Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus asks his disciples, uh, who do people say that I am? Disciples give various answers. And then Jesus answers, asks the pointed question, but who do you say that I am? Peter speaks first, as usual. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus commends him, commends the response and affirms to Peter and the other disciples that this is an insight given to Peter, not by other human beings, but by his father in heaven. And then Jesus goes on to explain to the disciples and Peter that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die. And then Peter goes and spoils it all. He rebukes Jesus for making that suggestion. And this prompts the rejoinder, the very pointed rejoinder from Jesus, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And here in our passage in Luke 22, Peter, here he goes again. His enthusiasm for Jesus far outweighs his wisdom and his insight. They wanted to arrest Jesus, but Peter was going to take control. Peter thought force of arms would do the trick. Listen to what we read in John 18. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given to me? What is the application for Peter and by extension for us? Spiritual battles can only be fought with spiritual weapons. Spiritual battles can only be fought with spiritual weapons. We can so easily forget that we have no power in and of ourselves to win spiritual battles. Listen to what Paul says to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. When we see a spiritual challenge, our instinct is to think that we can deal with it. We want to organize ourselves. We want to resolve to do better. We want to plan. We want to strategize. All good things in themselves. But in a spiritual battle, it is spiritual weapons that prevail. Feeding on God's word, prayer, discipleship, fellowship, putting on the full armour of God that we read about in Ephesians 6. So we must press on to our third heading. And again, it's about Peter. And our third heading is Peter, the overconfident denier. Peter, the overconfident denier. Peter had a mistaken view of his own abilities. Peter was to some degree self-sufficient. He thought that his own qualities would see him through. Not like the other disciples, of course. He was very proud. He disparaged his colleagues. Peter declared in Mark 14, Even if all fall away, I will not. But even, as if we, even as we read that statement, it leaves us with a kind of sense of foreboding that such pride will not work out well. I wonder if Peter ever read that verse in Proverbs 16. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. And Peter had a great fall. His failure was abject. He was challenged three times, including by a servant girl. 
and his bravado was shown up for what it was, an empty boast and cowardice. Three times he denies his Lord. Then Peter remembered the word that Jesus had spoken to him. Before the cock crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. So here is Peter. He is the overconfident denier. He confidently believes that he has within himself the resources to be brave and bold and courageous. And he ends up in abject failure, denying his Lord whom he loves three times. How can we apply Peter's story to ourselves? Well, the first application is a warning. And it's a warning against complacency. Paul, writing to the church at Corinth, says, So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Perhaps you've been a Christian for a long time. Why have you been a Christian for a long time? Is it because you have the innate ability to persevere? Not at all. The Bible tells us we cannot keep ourselves. God kept you. However many weeks or months or years you have been a Christian, it is because God has persevered, not because you have. He has persevered with you and he has kept you. We need to constantly remember that statement of Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God. We are what we are purely by the grace of God, not because of any innate qualities we have, not because of any innate strength, but purely because God has kept us. If you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. And the second application from this denial of Peter is by way of encouragement. Peter fell dramatically. He fell abjectly, but he found forgiveness. Peter found grace. Peter had messed up big time. But as we discover the story unfolding in the Gospels, we discover that Jesus did not write him off. And there is the story of how Jesus beautifully and graciously restored Peter to fellowship. And then later on in the books of Act, book of Acts and subsequently in the New Testament, we see how Peter was wonderfully used. Peter was a big character. He was a larger than life character. He had a lot of lessons to learn, but Jesus worked in his heart and Jesus worked in his life. And Peter was greatly used as an apostle. And then this brings us to the final character in our story, Jesus himself. And our final heading is Jesus, our self-possessed saviour. Jesus, our self-possessed saviour. As we read the story of the arrest and the crucifixion, the trial and the crucifixion of Jesus, we come across many what we would now call authority figures. There were the chief priests. There was Herod. There were the Pharisees. There was Pontius Pilate. There were the Roman soldiers, members of the occupying army, all of whom exercised authority. But in this story, there is only one person in charge, and that's Jesus, the carpenter from Galilee. He is the one who claimed to have authority over legions of angels on whom he could call. Notice in the story the pointed questions, the question to Judas. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? What a profound question. To the chief priests and officers of the temple guard and the elders who had come for him. Am I re leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Notice a statement to Peter when he cut off the ear of the high priest's servant with a sword. No more of this. Notice his power in healing that man's ear with just a touch. And then notice the effect on Peter of just a look, not even a word. Just a look from Jesus. In our passage, Luke twenty two sixty one, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. 
Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the cock crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. What a look that must have been. No words were needed. So there we have it, three characters in this story. Judas, the thief, the hypocrite, a betrayer who never truly repented and never found grace. Peter, bold, brash, misguided Peter. But in spite of his failure, in spite of his denial of his saviour, he repented with tears and he was graciously restored. And he was greatly used in the foundation and the development of the New Testament church. And finally, Jesus, the sovereign Lord, the one who was in control of it all, in all the chaos, in all the confusion, in all the evil, in all the injustice. He is utterly self-possessed. He is our Lord and Saviour. So just as we close, as we reflect on this story and the characters in it, and we reflect on our self-possessed Saviour, there is simply one question to ask. Do you know him? Do you love him? Do you serve him? Are you trusting him or are you trusting in yourself? He waits to receive you if you have never come to know him. Why not trust in him today? Ask him to give you the grace to repent of your sins and give you the grace to live for him and to serve him. And he will answer that prayer. Amen. Jesus built now the curse of sin